Hi, I'm Rhys Coleman, Waterways and Wetlands Research Manager in the Applied Research Team at Melbourne Water. And thanks for joining us for another edition of Melbourne Streams, where we've been showcasing research coming out of the Waterways and Wetlands Research Program. In this first series of talks, we're releasing a talk a day based on topics voted on by the waterways and land crews. So we really hope you've been enjoying them. Today's talk is from Dr. Joe Greet of the Melbourne Waterway Research to Practice Partnership with the University of Melbourne. Joe is a wetland ecologist with a keen interest in wetland restoration. He's been instrumental in a number of our partnership projects, including the hydrologic restoration of Yellingbow Nature Conservation Reserve, deer management and direct seeding as an alternative approach to riparian revegetation. Today's talk from Joe is about the response of vegetation to environmental watering of billabongs in the Yarra catchment. Joe starts by talking about wetland ecology in general and then provides two case studies, one in the Wurriyalak catchment and the other the lower Yarra billabongs. This research has been delivered in close collaboration with Melbourne Water's environmental water team including Tiana Preston, Sarah Gaskell, Cheryl Edwards and Bill Molden. If you have any technical questions about this talk, then contact Joe directly. He's kindly provided his details in the talk. Or if you have general questions about the Melbourne Waterway Research to Practice Partnership or the Waterways and Wetlands Research Program in general, then feel free to contact myself or Slobodanka Stojkovic, who's also in the Waterways and Wetlands Research team. Of course, you can now search the Research Hub, which is on the intranet. If you go to Research Hub, you can look at the various research projects we've been delivering and a range of outputs from those projects. In true Joe Greet style, he provides a number of gags along the way to keep you smiling. And there's also a cameo appearance of his daughter, Elsie. So we hope you enjoyed today's talk from Joe. Thanks. Hi, my name's Joe and I'm auditioning for the next season of Tiger King. Uh, no, actually, I'm a field ecologist, um, but I've been stuck at home since March and I'm going a bit loopy. Um, and I've been asked uh, to give a presentation uh, on my work with Melbourne Water through the Research Practice Partnership on the response of vegetation um, to environmental watering of billabongs. So let me just share my screen. <clears throat> so as I was saying here, my name's Joe Greet and I'm a, a lover of wetland plants. Uh, what to expect from this presentation? Well, who knows, but uh, possibly um, some brief information on, on floodplain wetland or billabong ecology. Uh, and then really just a couple of uh, short stories on a couple of projects I've worked on with Melbourne Water. Um, as we know, wetlands are incredibly um, biodiverse places providing um, habitats for a, a wide range of, of, of flora and, and fauna. Um, birds, bats and possums living in the hollows and feeding off um, the nectar and other resources from trees, fringing vegetation, providing habitat for frogs and other amphibious critters, uh, and all this vegetation providing large woody debris and the detritus, which is the, the fuel which drives these aquatic food webs. Um, wetlands are often also uh, some of the, the last remnant um, habitats within otherwise cleared or degraded landscapes and provide corridors um, for dispersal and movement uh, through these degraded landscapes. Um, Melbourne's wetlands have of course been important places uh, for people uh, to live and to gather for tens of thousands of years. This is a picture from the mid 19th century of uh, some Wurundjeri people on the banks of the Mary Creek. You can see an eel trap constructed in the water, people fishing by tor torchlight and, and camped on, on the banks um, of the creek. Uh, our waterways and wetlands are still uh, very important places where people like to gather. This is a photo from the Coburg, from Coburg Lake wading pool, um, uh, not far from, from where I'm sitting now, um, 
where people used to swim in water that was diverted from the creek into a pool. Uh, I wouldn't swim in the creek now, but uh, it, especially during ISO, of course, there's, there's still many people um, enjoying the environs of the Mary Creek. Now, wetlands, as we know, are very dynamic and, and complex environments uh, as a result of um, flow and, and, and flooding regimes interacting with different geomorphologies, benches, channels, levees, anabranches uh, or billabongs and each of these different um, microhabitats give rise to different plants and, and different plant species and different plant traits. Uh, wetland plants have been described by Michelle um, Casanova and Margaret Brock as fitting into the, these wetland plant groups shown here. On the right we have submerged vegetation um, which can germinate and grow and complete their life history underwater. Um, and at the other end, we have terrestrial species which do not tolerate flooding or only brief periods of, of flooding. Where in between, we have our amphibious plant forms. Um, sorry, my daughter's trying to um, make a cameo. Um, uh, amphibious <clears throat> plant types, uh, of which is a various um, traits and, and, and strategies to respond to or, or tolerate flooding. And these are the kind of plants that are typical of billabong environments, environments which both have wet and, and dry periods. Not only are uh, wetland plants uh, able to survive in these environments, but they also can take advantage of them. This work from some Dutch researchers show that Shoreline plants or those amphibious plant species often have seeds that are highly buoyant so that they can float along the top of the water for long periods of time and long distances, settling on remote shorelines uh, as waters recede to germinate um, and, and colonize. Uh, aquatic plants or submerged vegetation, we can see at the bottom of that elevational gradient often produce large heavy seeds which roll along the bottom of the water to find appropriate places for germination and, and, and growth. Um, whereas in more terrestrial environments at the top of the bank in this picture we find plant species more typically adapted to wind dispersal. The complexity of the uh, relationships between not only plants but also fauna with the wetting and drying cycles in floodplains is represented um, here through the traditional ecological knowledge of, of the indigenous peoples of the Daly River region, which just shows the complex and interrelated relations um, of biota in these complex and dynamic environments. So to my first uh, story, um, is about a project I worked on with Melbourne Water a few years ago now, um, of a restoration of a, a, a billabong along the Wurrialic Creek, known as McColl's Swamp. Now, a quick look at Google Earth will show you that um, the Yarra Valley and indeed much of lowland Victoria is being cleared for agriculture. Uh, a bit of a closer look and you can see along those river corridors, um, some ancient paths of these rivers which have moved, um, changed courses as, as they meander across these, these uh, lowland areas. And those former channels, those paleo channels, um, uh, are what we now know, um, or what we call billabongs, which is a beautiful word. Um, taken from uh, the Wiradjuri language um, of New South Wales uh, and is roughly translated to mean a watercourse which runs only after rain, um, which gives rise to the wetting and drying and dynamic nature of these habitats. Now through water extraction um, and water storage, say in the Upper Yarra Dam and, and many of the water supply reservoirs that Melbourne Water um, managers uh, flows in rivers like the Yarra River are greatly reduced and the overbank flooding, the seasonal pulses which drive um, 
the ecology in these systems um, have been largely lost. Um, so how do we make billabongs great again? Um, well, I guess we could blow up the Lower Yarra Dam, um, but that would have, um, of course, unwanted consequences. So what can we do? Well, there are cases where we can still engage or in increase the flooding of these um, of, of billabongs. Um, and this is an example of a case where we did and, and it was successful. So that top picture is of, of McColl Swamp uh, along the Wurrialic Creek within the Allingbo Nature Conservation Reserve. Uh, not far from some uh, colonies of the helmeted honey eater, our, our bird emblem, um, and of which there's, there's less than a couple of hundred uh, remaining in the wild. Now this is a site that was is was formerly um, part of uh, farmland, uh, but had been given back to the reserve um, and was to be restored. Um, mostly through the good work of the Friends of the Helmet Honey Eater. Um, we can see there's some deer proof fencing that have been put up, there was some planting. Um, and we can see it's largely cleared of overstory, but there's some really good quality understory, some spike rush, some rushes, and some native herbs throughout this wetland system. Um, the swamp has been disconnected from the Wurrialic Creek. In the bottom left, you can see about a one metre high levee on, upon which the, um, the access road sits. Um, and so we got a big pump, you can see in the bottom right photo, and that's Rob DeBau, who uh, is a former employee of Melbourne Water. Um, and we pumped water directly from the Wurrialic Creek over the levee and into the uh, into McColl Swamp. And I've got a short video here. So this is us just getting ready. The pump has been put into place um, and is now turned on. In the middle of the swamp there, you can see some matting, which was used um, to suppress Phalaris arundinaceae, a, a noxious uh, semi-aquatic grass. Um, but we were hoping that the flooding would, would, would control a lot of the terrestrial weeds, the Holcus linatus and other species present within the swamp. Uh, we're running around um, measuring water quality and other things. We monitor water levels continuously. Um, and if nothing else, you can see there were some ducks and also some herons and also an Azura kingfisher. The birds arrived pretty quickly after the water was introduced. Um, and we, we surveyed understory vegetation across the flooding gradient, um, both before and after the flooding. So the flooding we introduced was only a small area, it was only about three megalitres, but um, provided for about 50 centimetres depth in the middle there and um, flooded an area of about half a hectare. So the event that um, we caused is, is highlighted there with the oval, that's the hydrograph of the McColl Swamp on the left, the one we flooded, and of a nearby um, billabong on the right. And what have we found? We found that with longer duration flooding, there was a greater change, a greater increase in, in the cover of amphibious plant species. And correspondingly, there was a, a, a greater decrease in the cover of terrestrial species. And a lot of these terrestrial species were weeds in their system. Um, so we also saw a corresponding reduction um, in, exo in exotic plant species within this system with increasing duration of inundation. Um, which we promoted through our flooding event. Uh, and here's a picture just of one of my favourite uh, wetland plants, Ren Ranunculus inundatus, uh, with its beautiful ferny foliage um, that was uh, very sparse before the flooding, but which germinated in large numbers from the seed bank and was abundant post, post flooding. So that was really exciting. Um, and here we can see uh, the fences, the planting, uh, the water being introduced, and there's currently a, a, a beautiful wetland um, wetland uh, forest developing at that site. So with our objective being to restore native wetland forests, 
although there was a cleared over story and a levy, high browsing pressure and lots of weeds, there was some good quality native, um, uh, extant native vegetation. Um, so through fencing, planting and reconnecting uh, this site via pumping, um, it, it, the project was a success. Now, of course, uh, to do so each year would probably be quite a resource intensive um, and expensive exercise, but there might be other options whereby the flooding, uh, regular flooding could be introduced um, into this site um, and it's currently being explored, such as the introduction of box culverts um, or complete removal of that levee road, which in part is, is, is falling into the creek and um, is no longer accessible anyhow. Okay, on to a case study number two, which is a project that I began working on with Melbourne Water um, just last year um, and is currently in development. Um, but uh, yeah, is, is, I'm finding pretty exciting and um, I'll tell you a bit about it now. So there are a few remaining um, billabongs uh, along the, the lower Yarra or Birrarung, um, with uh, those few remaining uh, mostly degraded um, due to lack of flooding, um, due to reduced flow levels in the Yarra, but also through earthworks, um, disconnecting those sites, uh, and being urban, of course, there's, there's high weed loads, there's water quality issues, um, amongst other uh, human impacts. Despite this, there are a few sites which um, retain important ecological um, values. And of course, these sites uh, are important um, for social and recreational values. And, and to the, the indigenous, the Wurundjeri people, they retain uh, incredibly important cultural values. Um, now, uh, there have been investigations going on um, over, over decades or more to uh, identify priority billabong sites um, and how these important values can be enhanced. Um, and one of those means is through um, targeted environmental watering. Um, and that's what I'll be talking to you about just now. So I just find this picture interesting. It's an aerial um, photo taken um, probably by a returned soldier just post World War II. Um, they need to find something for these people to do and we had new technologies and one of those was um, aerial photography. So here we've got, um, sorry, my daughter, hello. We have a letter E because my daughter's name is Elsie. This is Elsie, hello. Okay, lovely. I'll come and check it out with you later. Hun, hun, I need to keep doing this. Can you give me a moment, please? And where were we? Yeah, cool. So looking at this, you can see that uh, this is the lower Yarra from uh, lower plenty to around Q. That it's largely devoid of any native vegetation. If you look closely, you can see the, the, um, the imprints of, of some of the former billabong. Some of them have been filled in. Uh, mostly they're clear. There are a few remaining. Um, Bolin Bolin is a, a notable one towards the bottom left, which retains some vegetation and also appears to have some water in it. Um, but that these systems were heavily modified um, by that time. Um, today, some they, they, they look probably better than they, they did back then. Um, there's been a lot of work to protect and also restore through revegetation and weed control and other means, these sites. Um, and even despite that um, recent history of degradation provide important habitat for a range of Fauna, frogs, birds, um, we can see a wallaby at Bolin Bolin, 
uh, in the top right that I've taken a photo. In the bottom left was a, a, a structure showing the social, uh, the fun and games which goes on at these sites. Um, and bottom right, um, of course, uh, these sites still retain um, an important um, an importance for the for the Wurundjeri. Now here's a few sites that have been identified by Melbourne Water as priority sites, um, and I uh, for this program have been surveying the vegetation at these six. So from the top right hand corner or the upstream end, we have Montpellier. Uh, Billabong uh, in Lower Plenty, uh, Banyul um, is next, uh, Bolin Bolin in the middle, and then down towards uh, Q we have Burke Road Billabong, Horseshoe Billabong in the, in the golf course there, and at the very uh, bottom left we have Wilsmere Billabong. Um, these sites have varying um, levels of connectivity. Um, and thus propensity to flood. Um, some of them flooding uh, frequently in Montpellier and Horseshoe being still well connected uh, to the Yarra. Uh, other sites have been largely disconnected such as um, Banyul uh, and Burke Road where Bolin Bolin and Will Smear still flood on occasion maybe. Um, actually Bolin Bolin flooded last weekend so that was very excited but hadn't flooded naturally for a uh, good five or six years. Um, some of these sites have received environmental watering in, in recent years. Um, in fact, uh, most of those, uh, four of those six sites, Burke Road, Bolin Bolin, um, Wilsmere and Banyul in the last few years. Um, anyway, I digress. Um, so as part of this program, uh, I have been monitoring the understory vegetation using permanent 10 by 10 meter quadrats, looking at tree condition and reproductive output of some of the big old river red gums growing along these billabongs. Um, there's been some water level monitoring um, and uh, I'd just uh, like to highlight that um, while this program has been in development, we've now got Wondery's NARIP team the NRM team on board and, and they were looking to further develop the program to consider cultural values in, in further years. Um, so here is a, is a map of some of the monitoring going on at Bolin Bolin. Um, the permanent quadrats shown with the yellow, square, uh, the yellow squares and the, the survey trees are the, the red dots. Uh, here's an example of one of the understory vegetation Quadrats and my colleague Scott um, during one of our surveys. Um, the the quadrats were randomly placed within areas that we thought had a potential to flood in the case that there was overbank flooding um, or they received environmental watering. Uh, for the trees, uh, we used those aerial photos that I showed you earlier to identify areas, uh, well, firstly billabongs and then areas within those billabongs that uh, were treed in 1945, so that we were only looking to survey um, some of the big old trees uh, for two reasons, um, because these trees are often very important um, ecologically, um, they provide the greatest output in terms of seed for potential recruitment and nectar for birds and and other animals, um, and also their um, their cultural significance. Um, so that's Banyul Billabong there, and you can see the right hand, the, the, the eastern arm was completely cleared, and so we didn't survey that for trees. Here are some of the big old river red gums, beautiful uh, growing along these systems, and they were chosen um, for their wide girth, their, their rough bark skirts, the presence of hollows, and their unruly growth form. Um, trees were measured for size using DBH tape, scored for condition, basically um, using the Living Murray method. You imagine a, a perfect tree being a 100% um, 
hundred percent healthy, and then you score a tree as a proportion of the of of, of um, the what you imagine to be a reference tree. It's a subjective measure, but it's shown to be consistently scored uh, across a range of observers. And we scored it for flowering, um, either absent, scarce, common, or abundant. Um, uh, these billabongs have also been mapped using LIDAR. And from that, this is some work from Jacobs, we can see at what flow levels in the era they would um, become connected. Um, and so this is the area again from lower plenty down to Q. Um, and the blue billabongs indicate those that regularly engage. Uh, and again, um, and then yellow, the Green ones uh, sometimes engage, and then the yellow and orange rarely engage. Um, and it might be a bit hard to see on this map, but of the six sites that I've selected, um, two of them are blue, Montpellier and Horseshoe, in that they regularly engage, two of them are yellow, and engage, sorry, two of them are green, Bolin, Bolin and Wilsmere, and they intermittently engage, and then the yellow ones, Banyul and Burke Road uh, rarely engage. Um, and that relationship between their commence to fill level based on flow levels in the ARA at Heidelberg um, and flows in the ARA are shown in this hydrograph. So the horizontal line for each billabong indicating the flow level required for wards to spill into those sites. Um, so you can see Banyul at the top and Montpellier at the bottom. Um, and this is showing the hydrograph in the era from the beginning of 2019 until about midway through this year. They also indicated uh, the timing of the spring and summer surveys. So the aim is to survey prior to and post um, seasonal flooding um, or any um, environmental watering event. Uh, and you can see during the first year of this program that Montpellier uh, was the only site that engaged and it did on a few occasions uh, but none of the others flooded naturally. However, there was an environmental watering event at Banyul. Um, so those were the two sites that flooded between uh, the surveys. And here we did actually have water levels recorded for those two sites um, uh, from about mid-September and we can see at Montpellier uh, the water levels um, going up and down with those uh, natural flooding events and the uh, large but relatively brief spike from the um, environmental watering at Banyul, which lasted for about a month, um, the month of October. So this is what Banyul looked like in early spring at a photo point set up. Um, and we can see that the site was largely dominated by thistles. It was a um, not much fun to get around. Uh, there were also um, lots of other weeds, but the occasional um, native sedge, tussock, carex oppressor, um, and an intermittent uh, native, native herbs. That's um, what it looked like at about the height of the flooding, so it reached about one metre in depth. Um, and as I said, lasted about a month. And this is quite a bit later, but in late summer, we can see that the majority of that terrestrial um, weedy vegetation died back. Um, and it's hard to see from the photo, but much of that regenerating green that we can see carpeting the base of the wetland were native species. So Alternanthera denticulata, lesser joyweed, uh, persicarias, also lots of carex and juncus seedlings. Um, of course, there were also um, lots of thistle and, and other um, weeds germinating also. Um, here is just a couple more pictures from Montpellier. This is one of our permanent quadrats. At this site, which receives regular flooding, you've got these large um, native flood tolerant species. Uh, here is a, a Juncus um, tussock. Um, and then in summer, um, in those in-between areas, you've got just a swathe of, of native herbaceous species. It looks like, yeah, I think that's Persicaria hydropiper. Um, 
just flourishing um, at, at that site. Um, so just a couple of quick graphs. Um, looking at wetland plant cover, noting that uh, Horseshoe and Wilsmere were only surveyed in summer, but if we look at from spring to summer, um, that the cover of wetland plant species increased across um, all the sites um, that were resurveyed. Um, and in, in particular at the site that was watered, Banyul in the, in the, in the purple, um, the only site where it decreased was at Bollin, um, where, and that was the site that has been least recently flooded. Uh, it received an environmental watering event in 2017. Although, as I mentioned, it just received a natural flood event last week. Very exciting. Um, correspondingly, uh, at Banyul, it appeared that the environmental watering um, resulted in a, in a big reduction in the cover of exotic plant cover, which uh, was which was really high um, preceding the watering event. At most other sites, um, Montpellier and Burke Road, uh, levels of exotic plant cover remain fairly steady, um, except again, um, they increased at Bolin Bolin uh, in contrast to the other sites. And if we look just at species richness um, of those six Billabong sites, um, considering both surveys um, and all quadrats, uh, we've got the native uh, species richness in uh, in the dark blue and exotic in yellow. See that these sites are dominated by weeds and exotic terrestrial species. They are degraded sites by and large. Um, however, in a kind of a rough gradient from dry on the left to, to wetter on the right, um, there is some evidence of, of an increase with, of, of native species richness uh, with increased wetness or uh, frequency of, of flooding um, and, and potentially a, a decrease in exotic native species. The one site where um, there were more native species recorded than exotic um, plant species was Wilsmere. And while that has a, a, a moderate um, propensity to flood or an intermediate commence to fill, uh, it receives water directly through stormwater inputs um, during large storm events. And so actually uh, is, is listed in, in that graph as the wetter site because it actually floods and was flooded um, on each visit. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Oh, here we go, um, this moment. So this is a picture from Wilsmere and across all the sites has the best quality native um, vegetation that was surveyed um, and is interesting. Um, Stormwater inputs, of course, um, might have implications for water quality and for uh, amphibious biota such as frogs. Um, but in, in this case, it seems to be promoting um, a rich diversity and, and good condition native uh, wetland vegetation. To the trees, uh, tree sizes and crown extent, so that's the condition of these trees was uh, remarkably consistent across all sites, uh, indicating that these trees may not be reliant on on flooding events per se. Um, they are large trees and might be well connected to groundwater resources, especially given their proximity to the Yarra um, and thus their, their, their size or growth and, and condition is independent of, of flooding, a local flooding of, the, of these billabong sites. However, we did find uh, a, this is flowering of trees from abundant, uh, from absent to abundant, from left to right across all sites. It was pretty even across all sites, except for Banyul, where a mass flowering event was observed. And there's a potential that, I guess this was um, a result of the environmental watering event that occurred there. This is something that we're looking to explore further through um, subsequent surveys. Here's just a few pictures um, of some of the um, important values of the trees, uh, some of the hollows, 
um, rainbow lorikeets and other birds were observed coming in and out of some of these beaches. On, on the far right, we can see a bee hive uh, inhabiting one of these hollows. On the far left was um, something, it was, it looked to me like it could potentially be a scar tree. Um, and I actually notified the Wondery Council and sent photos and they were interested enough to send out some archeologists and um, uh, some elders from the Wondery Council went and took a look and it, for them, the scar was too young to be uh, a historical scar tree, but um, it's definitely, the kind of feature that they were looking for and there are scar trees um, not that I surveyed but along along the river um, in these areas. So to sum up billabongs require regular wetting um, and drying. Um, while we know um, the, the specifics in terms of depth and duration is something that's currently uncertain and, and something that we're hoping to inform um, through through this program. Um, and while environmental watering events uh, are planned uh, at annulus this year and, and going forward, uh, I just thought I'd point out the long-term self-sustaining cost-effective solutions such as uh, lowered inlet levels and, and potentially treated stormwater inputs are uh, being explored for some of these sites. Um, and lastly, uh, I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, that this program will be further developed with a narrow team and hopefully give greater, greater uh, consideration of cultural values and the narrow team will be um, jointly undertaking the vegetation surveys uh, this year if I ever get out of North Coburg um, and in following years. Uh, thank you, I hope that made some sense. Uh, for chance, you have any follow-up questions, please um, drop me a line. Um, my email address there, and I'll be happy to send you a report uh, giving further details on the uh, on the the, the Birrung Billabong program. Um, I also encourage you to uh, visit the Wondery website and hear about some of the great work um, that they're doing. Thank you. And...